called uh, Asufi um, from the University of Missouri, and we will speak about the biographical dictionaries in a slightly different way from the Yuri Mouar to um, moments of last consciousness. Please, <laughs> something else. <laughs> no, I've got nothing. I just, if I have time, I have something. Okay, is my voice loud enough for everybody to hear? Or do I really have to use the microphone? Because if I have to use the microphone, uh, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time kind of thing, and I'll mess up. Is it okay? It's for the recording, though. Oh, it's for the recording. Oh. All right. Oh, my God. This is going to totally foul me up. All right. So let, let me just begin by stressing that what, what I'm doing here is uh, A, very much still a work in progress, and two is only a very broad outline of this book project that I'm currently working on. Uh, the book is about biographical representations of Sufis between the 12th and 16th centuries, and this book uh, is supposed to be, at least uh, right now, it's going to be some, something like a prolegomena to a second book on hagiography. Uh, and I envision these two books going hand in hand, and the idea is that the, the, this preliminary work on biographical dictionaries is first a tentative step toward exploring to what extent a generic distinction between biography and hagiography is justified in the Arabic sources, and second, if that distinction is merited, to theorize the difference as coherently and precisely as possible. At this point, I believe the distinction is not only warranted, but is absolutely critical if we want to use biography and hagiography in responsible and innovative ways in our own historiography. This microphone's already totally fouling me up. <laughs> Both of these projects developed ex organically from the extensive prosopographical research I did for my first book on the popularization of Sufism in Egypt. I had no intention at the time, uh, or even up until recently, of looking so extensively at the Mamluk period, but as I, as I went further and further into this material, it just became obvious that the, Ma, the Mamluk sources were uh, where the game was at, I guess you could say. Uh, as I collected more and more, it was coming from the Mamluk period, and I, and I slowly became obsessed with this Mamluk material uh, and the multitude of delights that you find therein. This is all a, a really a long cop-out for me to say I'm not truly a Mamlukist. Uh, I'm much more comfortable in the field of Sufi studies. I'm much more familiar with the historiography of Sufism. So I'm hoping that you, the what I will call the true Mamlukists, will uh, tell me where I have, uh, where I'm going well and I'm on the path, where I'm going off the path, where I'm losing my mind, uh, and to suggest fruitful ways forward. The one thing that I'll ask that you do not do is try to talk me out of what I'm doing. Uh, it's too late. Okay, so here we go. So. There are two problems that have vexed me uh, for a while while I've been working on these biographical dictionaries. First, why are there so many of them in the Mamluk period? The second question is why are they so full of people who don't seem to belong there according to any of the typical criteria of inclusion we find in earlier biographical compendia? At least it seems to me this way, right? Mamluk biographical dictionaries are full of tramps, scoundrels, tricksters, wicked politicians, conniving viziers, failed scholars, and so on, especially and including the sordid details of their exploits, right? And I'm thinking here of uh, a Sahawi in Al Alan, where he says very explicitly that people like this do not belong in Tarikh. He's uh, quite explicit about this, and so are some other historians. So if, the, if, if people feel this way, then why are all of these wicked people in these dictionaries? So I'm working on a theory that I think addresses both of my questions holistically, um, but first let me give you an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. So, a great number of Mamluk era dictionaries, both Syrian and Egyptian, contain the biography of a certain Alamadin, uh, Alamadin ibn, sorry, it's microphone, it's, it's totally its fault, Ahmed ibn Asahib. He died in 1289. His grandfather, Abdullah, founded the first Maliki Madrasa in Egypt, and he was the vizier to both al Malik al Adil and al Malik al Kamil. He had a son, Yusuf who also taught at the madrasa, and likewise he was the vizier to al Kamil. Both of these men were prominent scholars and political players, although the grandfather was pretty well, uh, if any of you are familiar with him, he was universally loathed in the, in the historiography for being a kind of rapacious and cruel man. Famously, as he was sick and dying, he brought a bunch of his political enemies into his room as he was dying and had them tortured viciously so that their screams and cries would cheer him up as he died. Um, so this is the kind of person we're dealing with. 
But that's the grandfather. I'm not talking about the grandfather. So the, the grandson, Alamadim Ahmed, he was a total joke, both literally and figuratively. After briefly studying at the family madrasa, he had a nervous breakdown, apparently. Al-Fayumi is the only person who mentioned this, and he makes it sound like he had a nervous breakdown. And he spent a year at the hospital in Cairo. Afterwards, he abandoned his academic pursuits, he mocked and repudiated his reputable acquaintances, and he found new friends among the riffraff of the city, namely the Harafish. He dressed in odd and outlandish fashions, he spent his days panhandling in the alleys and thoroughfares of Cairo, wandering around the outskirts of the city with a hashish-eating donkey, and there's really good stories about that. Uh, he consumed wine and hashish, wrote mediocre poems in praise of both, although he did write one where he writes about uh, talking about uh, drinking the red and eating the green is totally fine, but when you do it together, then you have to ask directions home because you get too confused, obviously. Uh, so he's an interesting man. His friends deserted him. His children repudiated him. His children were also scholars. He wrote no works of law, theology, philosophy, or Sufism. He was not a prolific or creative poet. He did not collect or transmit hadith. He did not build or endow a madrasa, revat, or khanka. He fought in no battles. He was not engaged in politics. He did not perform miracles. He was not blind. So in short, he did nothing that you would do to get into a biographical dictionary in the Mamluk period, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So why is he so ubiquitous? He is in almost all of the major collections. So I believe the answer to this question is inextricably linked to my first question concerning the explosion of historic, historical writing during the Mamluk period. So just a brief little uh, overview here. Uh, Dorothy Kravulski has argued that this eruption was the result of resounding Mamluk military success, precipitating a pro prolific rearticulation of the Dar al-Islam from within a new political context. More indirectly, Chamberlain maintains that the proliferation of his endowed stipendiary post during this period fostered a new social praxis organized around competition for resources among the ulama. So one can extra <coughs> extrapolate from that that Given the increasing numbers of jobs available and the increasing competition, of course, biographical dictionaries would increase in number and size. Uh, but I want to go, I think these are, these are good explanations, but I want to go much further and combine these arguments with Ibn Khaldun's sociology of Asabiya, Ulrich Harman's notion of literarizierung of Mamluk historiography, Thomas Bauer's description of the Arabization of the ulama, Conrad Hirschler's call for a cultural turn in the study of Arabic historiography, his description of biographical dictionaries as a type of archive, although he just told me he's maybe rethinking that. We'll leave, we'll leave that alone. Uh, and then I want to join all of that to my own idiosyncratic approach to the relationship between Mamluk political economy, social capital, class, and cultural production. And here I'm most influenced by uh, the British Marxist historians of the 1960s and 70s and the French structural Marxists of the 1970s. So here we go. I obviously can't do all that here. So what I want to do in, the, in my short time is give you two versions of my argument, the short version so that I kind of get it out of the way, and then a longer version where I kind of explain where my thinking is coming from. Hopefully this will be clear, but uh, my thinking is not always as clear as I think it is. So first, the short version. Let me introduce my short version with my love, Leon Trotsky. In his brilliant literature and revolution, he writes, culture feeds on the sap of economics and a material surplus is necessary so that culture may grow, develop, and become subtle. What Trotsky begins here is a fascinating analysis of the precise relationship between social formation, the modes and relations of production, and the forms of culture enabled and constrained by that formation. So Trotsky's writing in 1924, and at that point, he still uh, believes Stalin hasn't kicked him out yet, and he still believes firmly that the revolution is going to produce a classless society, and that that classless society will produce a new kind of literature. Um, hasn't happened yet, but it will happen, and he just doesn't know what it will look like yet. So this material linkage between social formation, class, and cultural production is where my intervention lies, or I hope. I want to argue that Mamluk dictionaries are not simply or not only ad hoc records of reputations, networks, competition, honorifics, employment history, uh, constructions of tawa'if, madhab histories, politics of Mamluk households, etc. The dictionaries do, of course, record these details, but they do so only insofar as they illustrate the interests, anxieties, and social logics of the ulama as a distinct socioeconomic class. 
reflecting their positionality within and material relationship to a particular social formation. That is to say that biographical dictionaries, Mamluk ones, are the best record we possess of the ulama as a class conscious collectivity, which is to say that these anecdotes represent the hallmarks of class, collective expression of exploitation and conflict, either between other classes or among their own ranks as they jockeyed for resources. All these anecdotes of all kinds are the discursive representations of class, class consciousness, and class conflict. And here I'm really following uh, E.P. Thompson's uh, The Emergence of the Working Class in England, uh, where he writes about class conflict actually preceding the emergence of class consciousness. So I'm arguing that the conflict engendered by this new social formation leads to a uh, consciousness among the classes, uh, uh, excuse me, in the ulama. Okay, now, if I haven't already lost you, and I probably have because I'm just spewing Marxist terminology, I'll give you the longer version. <clears throat> Here it goes. I submit that the military patronage state that was developed by the Seljuks, spread by the Atabegs of Mosul, perfected by the Ayyubids and then the Mamluks, constituted a fundamentally new social formation within Islamic civilization, which created the necessary and sufficient social and economic conditions for the production and reproduction of the ulama as a social class. Side note, in my field of religious studies, uh, they use social formation very differently from the way that I mean it. They use social formation to me to uh, kind of describe what sociologists would call affinity groups, uh, groups linked together through mutual interest. And for religious studies, social formations are held together through myth and ritual. That's not what I mean here. What I mean is I follow Louis Althusser in defining social formation as the totality of economic, political, and ideological practices that constitute society itself. Critically, a social formation is never static. It is always in flux because of the dynamic processes inherent in the aforementioned practices, which are the grounds from which spring class formation, conflict, and social change. I know, I'm sorry. I'll, it's going to make sense. What I'm saying in simple terms is that the social formation of the military patronage state, as elaborated first by Hodgson, then in more detail by Chamberlain, and more recently for the Mamluk contest by Jovan Steenbergen, uh, transformed the modes of material and cultural production by reorganizing the expropriation of, competition for, and allocation of resources in a completely new way. At the heart of this transformation was the explicit politicization of the economic instruments of the Iqtah and the Waqf. The former, the Iqtah, to keep elite military households economically stable and politically compliant, and the waqf to keep the ulama, both jurists and Sufis, economically placated in exchange for legitimizing the ruling elites. This is kind of a cynical analysis, but you'll see. In essence, the military patronage state as a radically new social formation created the social, economic, and political conditions necessary for the emergence of class. Now, <clears throat> Marx himself was never entirely clear on how he theorized class. Very famously, at the end of the third volume of Capital, um, he says, now, to talk about class, and then Engels writes, and here the manuscript breaks off. So we don't know what Marx would have said exactly about class, but I think we can get a, a pretty good idea from, from some of his other writings, and especially I'm, I'm drawing heavily on the, the British Marxist tradition here, uh, especially uh, de saint Croix's uh, magisterial, the class struggle in the ancient Greek world, where he defines class as, quote, essentially a relationship. It is the collective social expression of the fact of exploitation, the way in which exploitation is embodied in social structure." End quote. So I argue that both the Iqtah and the Waqf rely fundamentally on the exploitation of the local peasantry to expropriate surplus value to keep the military patronage state solvent. We would therefore expect to see some indication, however expressed in literary texts, of class and class conflict among and between the exploited and the exploiters. The ongoing peasant revolts in Upper Egypt are one example, and if you're familiar with those sources, they're just constantly, uh, the, the peasants in Upper Egypt are just constantly revolting against the Amamluk overlords, and they have all of these really great slogans that Trotsky would have loved about uh, how they are you know, fighting imperialism and things. So, re what I want to focus, though, here is on the particular consequence of the military patronage state in particular, the commodification of knowledge as it is productive of class formation. Through the instrument of the waqf, which supplied the material conditions necessary for the production of knowledge in exchange for the performance of legitimacy, knowledge itself became enmeshed in the relations of production and thus ab abstracted from the labor of that 
authorized it in, a, in essence, right? It made the labor invisible. In other words, knowledge produced at madrasas and khankas, like I said last year about Baraka, became a commodity fetish. The product of human labor abstracted from its use value, existing solely within economies of exchange. In this case, in complex exchanges of social and cultural capital, which of course, Bourdieu would insist are ultimately economic in the final analysis anyway. So when I say that the Saljuk, Zengid, Ayyubid, Mamluk military patronage state constitutes a new and unique social formation, I want to highlight the ways that these newly organized modes and relations of production produced class. Most important to this process from my perspective was the production of commoditized knowledge, the pra a practice that constituted the ideological superstructure that naturalized the entire system. So I see the ulama as a class in two overlapping senses. One, they controlled the means of cultural production, by which I mean right there are the people who actually are producing the cultural production that naturalizes the system. Uh, and two, their position depended upon the patronage of the military class who extracted surplus value from peasant labor through brute exploitation. As a result of numbers one and two then, the ulama developed a sense of themselves as a coherent socioeconomic class, developed strategies to define and protect their class interests, and in the process evinced an acute anxiety about what was happening. And this anxiety about the emergence of, the, of their self-conception as class is kind of key to what I'm trying to do here. So a very early example of what I'm talking about is Al-Ghazali's decision to leave his post at the Nizamiya in Baghdad. As Kenneth Garden has shown in great detail recently, that decision had little to do with Al-Ghazali's supposed crisis of faith, which is really just a literary trope, and had everything to do with his disillusionment with the fact of state-sponsored knowledge production and the commodification that sponsorship entailed. We really see this issue come to the fore, though, in the next generation. It's no coincidence, I would argue, that we see the clearest example of this historiographical sea change with Ibn al-Jawzi's Al-Muntadhum fi tarikh which uh, coming right on the heels of the Seljuk Revolution, for the first time, as far as I know, systematically combines the genre of the analytic chronicle and the biographical compendium combined to devote the, uh, to or describe the ulama and their uneasy relationship with the elites who funded them. Ibn al-Jawzi's al-Muntadham displays precisely this kind of self-conscious awareness of the scholars as a, dis as a distinct class with vested, albeit troubled and anxious interests in the system of expropriation. Uh, Ibn al-Jawzi himself, it's worth remembering, was on the payroll uh, he ran at least five madrasas in addition to working for the caliph and the vizier in several different capacities. And uh, Sibt ibn al-Jawzi, I think, is another really good example of this. His Mirat al-Zaman is one of the best examples and, and one of the ones that I'm using quite extensively in what I'm doing here. So the social formation that we call the military patronage state was instantiated across the Middle East and as elites founded madrasas, ribats, and khankas in greater and greater numbers, the roles of the ulama dependent upon this economic system swelled. It's no wonder then that as these organizations and individuals multiplied, so too did the narratives reflecting their own self-conceptualization within and their own autocritique of this social formation. Wadad al-Qadi gets at this notion when she describes biographical dictionaries as, quote, the scholar's alternative history. This, I think, gets at uh, part of what's going on here, but she doesn't push this far enough. These dictionaries are not merely a means of placing the scholars at the center of an alternative narrative. post saljuk dictionaries are the history of an anxiety-riddled relationship to a new social formation that had precipitated commoditized knowledge in, a ways, in ways that had been anathema to previous generations. And if you read pre-Seljuk texts on this, right, they are constantly berating and belittling anybody who accepts money in exchange for producing knowledge. They still have this anxiety afterwards, but they're getting paid, so who's going to stop them? How's my time? Um, one moment. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Let's uh, go right here then. Okay, so to return to Trotsky, the economic sap extracted from the peasants on a mass scale by the military patronage state fed and nourished the cultural production we see in the Mamluk period, a cultural production shot through with the consciousness and anxieties of a parasitic class of scholars. I don't mean that negatively exactly, but I really do. Uh, any, there's a lot more to my project than just 
this aspect of it, and I'm happy to answer other questions about it, but I wanted to give you the bare outlines of my thinking about the place of class and the formation of class and the role of conflict and social formation and all of this. Uh, but let me go back to uh, our friend Alamadine Ahmed and his hashish eating, wine drinking, layabout, lazy man who graces the pages of so many dictionaries. I just want to give you a few examples of the anecdotes that they tell about him so that you get a sense of what I'm talking about and why I think they're so indicative of this, this, this anxiety and this consciousness. Okay, so here's a couple. One day, Alamadin attended one of the madrasas as the naqib was announcing those present. The naqib says, in the name of God, so-and-so a deen qalyubi. In the name of God, so-and-so a deen damanhuri. In the name of God, so-and-so a deen al-minufi and so on. The Naqib mentioned each person in his nispa that linked him to the countryside. al said, good God, is this a madrasa or a flax winnow? Right? Meaning, all of these guys are from the countryside. What the hell's going on? Here's another one. One day, al attended a lesson at one of the madrasas while those present were searching for something that they had knocked over on the floor. So you have to imagine they're all on their hands and knees looking for something on the floor. al got up and went to the middle of the circle and indicated that he was going to urinate all over the scholars. Someone said, what's up with this? To which he replied, is it such a big deal if a man urinates among his goats and cows? Again, these guys are all from the countryside, obviously. Another one. One day, al entered a madrasa, but while he was in the hallway, he heard the ulama inside disparaging him. When he entered, he urinated all over them. They said, what is this? <laughs> such a great response. And he said, anything whose flesh is eaten licitly, is the urine not also licit? which I think means, right, that they were calling him a cow or something. Um, and since cows are licit to eat, their urine's licit to drink. Uh, so for him. One more. When the Amir al-Shuja'i finished building the Mansuriya Madrasa, he saw al in the central square of Cairo. He said to him, al what do you think is better, this Madrasa or the Madrasa of Adal here across the street? al replied, your madrasa is very nice, except that when a man prays at the Vahiriya, his asshole is pointed right in the face of one praying at your madrasa. Okay, there are way more obscene stories in his uh, accounts than these. Uh, those are some of the more tame ones. There's one about uh, uh, a prostitute that I don't have time to tell you. But the idea here is that these anecdotes and many more like them, uh, and many more besides just al he's not the only one, uh, they include accounts of education, allocation of stipendiary posts, competition for resources. What they all have in common is that they are literary expression drawing upon literary te techniques developed since the Abbasid period of a self-conscious socioeconomic class whose ranks are growing in unforeseen and troubling ways, who are producing problematic forms of knowledge and whose existence depends upon the subject suspect patronage of a military elite who ex exploit the local population to fund their building programs and keep our scholars on the payroll. So let me end, I swear this is the end, with just a few caveats. First, I'm not arguing that class is something that is objectively out there. All we have to do is find it. Uh, I find it's a heuristic device, particularly when we're studying pre-capitalistic modes of production. It's a useful heuristic device to articulate the correlation between social formation and the relations of exploitation that undergird it. Second, I'm not arguing that all the authors of these dictionaries were members of this class or even had this kind of class consciousness. Rather, these stories circulated widely among the ulama, mostly among the non-authors, right? And it was the authors who collected them from the people and, and wrote them down. So very famously, a Safadi, when he introduces his long, he has the longest section on al -Madin. At the very beginning of his section in Al-Wafi, he says, uh, now I'll tell you anecdotes about al and these are stories that the Egyptians find utterly hilarious, which to me means, right, that he's in Cairo and he's hearing stories from all different kinds of people about this guy al which indicates to me that in Egypt, at least, these stories are very popular precisely because they highlight these anxieties about the new ways uh, and the new forms of scholarship and the way that these are happening. Um, I think that I will end there. I was going to end with a whole bunch of uh, stuff about my personal interest in this and uh, my personal politics and the way I use this in the classroom to try to destabilize my students' understanding of knowledge and knowledge production and the way that the diploma in the United States now is being commoditized. Well, now I'm just doing it, so I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll stop. The boss says to stop, so we'll stop. Okay, so that's it. Thank you.